Hello and welcome. My name is Meredith Melnick and I am the Health Director at the Huffington Post and today's moderator. Our hour-long program is a collaboration between the Forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the Huffington Post. The event also is part of the Dr. Lawrence H. and Roberta Cohn Forum Series. Welcome to Dr. and Mrs. Cohn. Um, today's discussion will be an exploration of the role and promise of telehealth, both in the United States and internationally. <coughs> At the end of the discussion, we will take questions from the online and studio audiences. Questions for the panelists can be emailed to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu, or they can be tweeted to at forum hsph using hashtag telehealthforum. You can also participate in a live chat discussion that's happening on the forum website right now. Now I'd like to introduce today's panelists. Ashish Jha is a professor of international health and director of the Harvard Global Health Institute here at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Mark Mitchell is the founder and president of D-Tree International, a clinical decision support software company and also a lecturer at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Randall Moore is the president of Mercy Virtual, which will open its first virtual care center in Missouri next month. Steve Crossan, who joins us remotely, leads public health initiatives at Google. And Maureen McCarthy, who is also joining us remotely, is Acting Chief Consultant for Telehealth Services at the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. And to get started, I'd like to start with you, Ashish. Um, let's start at the top. Can you please define telehealth? And uh, can you tell us how long this technology has been around and how it has improved and been implemented over the years? Sure. Sure, Meredith. Thank you for having me here. And, and I am going to take about three minutes to provide an overview on telehealth, sort of what it is, how it works, what we know about the evidence base, and then I'm going to turn it over to Mark, and the rest of the panelists will get into very specific uses uh, and instances of how telehealth is used. So if you look up the definition of global health, I mean of global health, telehealth, um, you will find lots and lots of different conceptions of what it is. But there are a few concepts that are recurring, and I want to kind of identify those. The fundamental notion behind telehealth is that it is about using electronic tools to provide care remotely. Right? It's a tool, usually uses some sort of electronic technology, and it's about provisions of care remotely. So that is in some ways the fundamental idea behind telehealth. It's used in lots of different ways. It's been around for a long time. Uh, radiology is probably the place where it's been used the most in healthcare and certainly the longest. Uh, the notion that you take a film and then some remote radiologist sitting in a dark room hundreds of miles away might read it and might give you uh, their professional reading. But over the last five, ten years, what we've seen is an explosion of telehealth use in lots of other parts of healthcare. So in the management of chronic disease, in the management of mental health, um, really in lots of ways we're seeing telehealth being used to provide daily ongoing care to patients. Um, telehealth comes in a variety of different forms. The classic one is sort of what we talk about as synchronous uh, technology, kind of a video. You're sitting there in front of a physician or a nurse, and you're, as a patient, describing your symptoms, and the person can make the diagnosis. That's kind of classically how we think about it, but there's a lot of asynchronous use. So asynchronous would be something like a physician takes a photograph of a skin lesion, sends it off, and a dermatologist six, eight hours later or even the next day might review it and give his or her uh, assessment of what's going on. And then a major use of telehealth is around remote monitoring. Um, and here the idea is uh, an EICU, by the way, is sort of probably the most widely used and well-known of this, which is you have a physician sitting uh, somewhere far away monitoring ICU patients in a hospital maybe hundreds or thousands of miles away. But there are lots of ways in which you can use remote monitoring. The fundamental notion of telehealth 
is that it is platform agnostic. And what I mean by that is you can be doing this using a PC, you can be doing this on a, on a tablet, you can be doing this on a mobile phone. So how widespread is the use of, of telehealth? Well, I would argue that we don't really have a great, um, a great precise number, but I'll share a few data points with you guys. Um, so from a survey about two years ago of American hospitals, about half of all American hospitals said they were using telehealth on a regular basis. Um, that number in the last couple of years has probably grown, and I would say that that probably was an underestimate. And so if you just look at the U.S., you would assume that a vast majority of hospitals now are using telehealth in one form or another. And obviously this is not just about hospitals. Provider organizations of all kinds are using it. Internationally, uh, we don't have comparable data, so I can't tell you what that number looks like in England or Denmark or Germany. But if you look across high and now low and middle income countries, you see massive investments happening in telehealth. Uh, countries around the world are using this a lot more, whether it's for uh, mental health care in Canada or for focusing on an older population in Australia. There's an incredible program that's trying to figure out how to keep rural older people in Australia at home for longer than they would have otherwise using telehealth. So a lot of creative uses uh, across the globe, and you'll hear about a bunch more of those. So the big question, of course, is does it work? And what do we mean by does it work? Well, does it improve access? Does it improve quality? Does it lower cost? I would argue that the evidence here is still pretty early. It's not very strong, but it is growing rapidly. Um, where the evidence is best is it improves access, especially for people who don't have access to physicians and nurses. Um, there is some evidence that it leads to better care. Where the evidence is the weakest is around cost savings. It's been chattered, chatted about a lot that somehow this is a technology that's going to save us a lot of money. Uh, I am deeply skeptical. I have not seen the evidence uh, that it is a big cost saving. Uh, my take is it is worth doing for the quality and access alone. If there are cost savings to be had, we have not yet seen them. Last point, we know telehealth is important because we're starting to see pushback. I don't know if you, many of you saw in a couple of weeks ago in the New York Times, there was a piece about that how the Texas Medical Association is basically trying to block the growth of telehealth across Texas. Their argument is that patients should have established relationships with physicians before they use technologies like this. Uh, it's based on a sort of a patient safety argument. They're trying to protect patients from telehealth. My take is that they're trying to protect their pocketbooks and not as focused on actual outcomes for patients. So here we are, um, I think the dawn of a new technology revolution in healthcare. Uh, telehealth is going to be one of the critical elements that's going to be very important in changing the way we uh, deliver care to our patients. Um, it is not, like most technologies, not a silver bullet. But if we can figure out how to use it effectively and efficiently, I think it can have very substantial effects on the health of populations. Thank you um, so much for that. And just to tease out one, one point you mentioned, um, uh, had the, the effect on access for rural communities. Um, and so, you know, I think that's something interesting about telehealth, that it actually is most sophisticated in places with the fewest resources. Um, and to help illustrate that further, I'd like to turn things over to Mark, who's going to introduce us to a, uh, a brief video clip that demonstrates how telemedicine is being used in a rural clinic in Malawi. Thank you. In much of the world, uh, people never in their lifetime will see a doctor. The only health worker they'll see lives in the community and has perhaps six weeks of training following primary school. So let me introduce you to Saidi Machila, who's a community health worker in rural Malawi, a poor country in East Africa. My name is Saidi Machila. Like in my data, I have about 2,000, 2015 people in this village. Uh, yeah, I do treat these under five children when they got maybe fever, diarrhea, and fast breathing. Sometimes they die. That's what I do. <laughs> this phone is just, we register the names of the child, sick child. And uh, the phone usually keeps that data in. Mm -hmm. about about July. July, 
and also gives us tells us how we can treat the child. Maybe gives us the, the amount of medication we have to give the child, and also maybe uh, some advices. Yeah? It also gives us the same. Okay, yeah, she had a fever and diarrhea, so we are giving this. Using the phone, I think it's a, a very good thing. I think we we'll keep keep using it. It's a very good. The cell phone that Saidi uses runs an app that was created by Dietrich International, and it takes him step by step through an assessment of the sick child. It identifies a correct diagnosis, correct treatment, including dose, how often, etc. It also stores the record for use by Saidi when he sees that person again and by his supervisor. Today, this app and others like it are being used by thousands of health workers in Africa to improve child health, facilitate safer deliveries for mothers and newborns, provide family planning and other health services. We believe that everyone, no matter who they are or where they live, has a right to high quality health care and that technology is a central part of bringing that care to people in rural Malawi and other parts of the world where otherwise they would not have access to this level of health care. Um, so telehealth obviously has a role to play in, in the clinic visits, um, but it also has a role in crises and pandemics. Last year, as Ebola was moving swiftly across several West African countries, Google created an app uh, that helped aid workers access medical records. Um, so I'd like to actually go to the monitor and talk to Steve. Can you tell us more about Project Buendia and some of the other Google initiatives in this space? Sure. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, so uh, I'll talk about Project Buendia in just a moment. Uh, strictly speaking, that's not a telecommunication, although it is an application that applies technology to a, a medical situation. Um, but I, what I would say is that um, Google, by default, ends up being one of the most consulted telehealth services in the world. Um, because when people are unwell, what do they do? Um, they don't go to Google and they make a search for symptoms. Uh, and this has been something that has long troubled us at Google because, as medical professionals will know, um, the quality of answers that you get from the internet when you have a question about your health is not always terrific. Um, uh, and as a result of that, uh, just recently, uh, we launched in the US uh, a set of much more curated experiences uh, which had been uh, vetted by a panel of doctors um, for uh, the top N conditions and symptoms and treatments that people ser search for, um, uh, which also then fall through to you know, uh, rated further places that you can go, uh, you know, clinics that you can call, helplines that you can call for further and more detailed information and passing you on to a physician uh, when appropriate. Um, so I think that, that the, the fact that uh, you know, users right across the world are coming to Google and other services for health information is evidence of the demand for these sorts of services. Um, we're still, frankly, at an early stage in their development, um, uh, but we hope that this is uh, really a first step towards uh, making that particular experience much better. Um, we also, in the public health group at Google, see... Uh, a, a strong role for technology um, uh, in conditions, you know, right across the world, including uh, the Ebola project that you mentioned. Um, at the outbreak of uh, Ebola in West Africa, we were contacted by a variety of organizations, one of which was Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, um, who really wanted to see whether they could use technology to solve a problem that they were facing in their clinics in the field, um, which was that uh, doctors in the field uh, wearing personal protective equipment 
um, uh, were in a very high risk, high infection environment, um, were finding it difficult to get round, get through ward rounds with perhaps 200 patients on a ward. Um, they had a limited amount of time to get around. Any equipment that was taken into the room could not be taken out again. Uh, so the state of the art for patient notes was really writing down notes on pieces of paper and then shouting them across the fence to a colleague who would write them down. And uh, then a third party would enter them into an Excel spreadsheet or a similar database on the laptop. This was an environment with without uh, power, um, or at least without regular and reliable power, without internet connection. Um, so we worked with them, and it was very much uh, Doctors Without Borders who did a lot of the design um, to try to uh, solve, to see what, how technology could, uh, could help to solve that particular problem, which is uh, really the problem of use of technology in a high risk and very remote environment. Um, uh, the result of that was a project called Project Buendia, which you can see at projectbuendia.org, um, and which is now deployed in the field. Um, it's an open source project. We're now building a consortium of uh, health partners in the NGO world to take that project forward and hopefully get it to have value in, in other things and in other situations beyond Ebola as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Steve. Um, I want to bring things back to a national setting and turn to Randall. Uh, we have a video clip of some of the work that Mercy Virtual has been doing to bring telemedicine to the hospital setting. So let's run that and then sure. we, can, we can go to you. Morning, Ms. Brooks. This is Susie from SafeWatch. We're just another pair of eyes for the nurses and the doctors down there. You glad to be out of that bed? From this floor at Mercy Hospital in Creve Coeur, Missouri, physicians and nurses monitor intensive care patients from all across the Midwest. This telemedicine program is called SafeWatch, and it's part of Mercy's EICU. Using today's technology, these caregivers are a second line of defense. We're saving lives in a few ways. Um, obviously, the, the big aha and the great catches are great. So um, it's great when we see something going on and we can intervene before things trend and get really bad. We also uh, do a lot of quality things. So uh, we do day-to-day -day quality checks, quality rounding sorts of things in real time, and we're able to to make changes in real time that affect the long term for the patient. It really is remarkable what, what one can do with the, uh, the technology uh, uh, when it is put in place, when the infrastructure is put in place. As an example, in the ICU, uh, uh, which is probably the highest intensity of monitoring uh, that one normally sees, uh, if a nurse walks out of the room, it is possible for the respirator uh, to fall off. Uh, it is possible for the IVs to stop and that uh, certain warnings don't trigger for uh, uh, seconds to minutes, whereas on the other hand, if you're being monitored through the EICU, it is almost instantaneous uh, when that uh, 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 safety measure is noted and, and, and corrected. Uh, the technology if you, it is, is so remarkable that you can take the, the camera and focus down to the, the pupils of the patient uh, the, uh, down to their pupillar dilatation as to whether or not there's any changes in the patient's condition. Mercy SafeWatch started in 2006. Its success has led to a proliferation of telemedicine programs. Today, more than 70 are in motion. This is Susie from SafeWatch. I want to go over the results for your last ultrasound and talk about your... Here, maternal fetal medicine specialist Dr. Jim Bartelsmeyer connects with a pregnant patient worried about a recent decrease in fetal movement. Of the, of the last ultrasound you had, and, and everything's looking great. The baby is growing normally. Uh, if you have a nurse on the other end, you can do, she can do part of the physical exam if, if need be. Obviously, sonographers are doing the ultrasound. Nurses may also be doing other fetal monitoring. Um, and so we're able to pretty much provide every degree of care that I would have been doing a consult here in the office if the patient were sitting next to me. These patients are in communities where there's not subspecialty care available, such as us, um, so they would have to travel and take off work for a full day, um, plus a lot of times they have to do follow-up um, testing, fetal testing, on once or twice a week, so it's a great convenience to them, uh, plus they have readily ready access to us.
Great. So, um, Randall, can you walk us through some of the um, applications in the hospital setting, and then also what this means for the uh, the virtual center that you're that you're creating? Sure thing. Mercy's a, a, a relatively good size organization situated through the Midwest. We have 35 hospitals, a couple thousand fully integrated physicians, 700 advanced providers, uh, 300 plus clinic sites. And we've been on a, a 10 year, roughly, intentional transformation to, as we say, get healthcare right, to build, to, to build a new model. And it's not hard to understand if you think, I want to have people think about it incrementally as well as disruptive. On the incremental side, uh, SafeWatch, which is our EICU program, or any number of continuous 24-hour day monitoring programs, we can fill gaps. We can be at the bedside when somebody else is not. And the interesting of what we found, even when we had 24-hour intensivists putting the EICU in place, the SafeWatch program, what we saw is a consistent trend uh, that keeps improving to where our Apache adjusted, our risk adjusted mortality is 30 plus percent less than predicted. Our length of stays are much less than predicted. In that environment, by filling the gaps, reacting faster, we can give better outcomes to people. And we've taken the same consistency and, and done that across a number of areas. We've done it in sepsis, and we've moved from monitoring the first sepsis beds to we're just approaching 3,000 beds across our system that are monitored real time, 24 hours a day. Now, it's just not about telemedicine. It's about what goes with it. If you just look and monitor somebody, nothing changes. Monitor with a complete rework of the workflow makes a huge difference. So part of our intentional journey is, how can we complete the care continuums inside of a hospital, make them work 24-7? Uh, how can we extend what our doctors, what our clinical teams do, and bring it to people where they are? Can we have patients who live in rural Arkansas get the same level of access to care as people who live in Springfield or St. Louis? And the answer is in the journey, yes, we can get there. We can bring care to people when and where they need it. So if you think about the transformation that technology can enable, I have a tendency to think of a hospital as a, as a place to bring providers and patients together with all the technology and resources so that we can build a care plan and with that care plan, we can put an expert inter interdisciplinary team around that care plan. And with that, we can take a patient, for instance, with heart failure, number one cause of hospitalization, who's coming in on the brinks of death, perhaps, and four or five days later, we're sending them out relatively in good shape compared to where they started. We do that through pretty simple things, a team, a plan, monitoring against it, and making sure the right person is getting that person at the right time. I think in five to 10 years, we're gonna look back and we're gonna realize what some people have thought, which is that uh, a lot of chronic disease, which is increasingly taking a majority of our hospital beds, that those should become ambulatory conditions. Because what do we do in the hospital? We put a plan together, we hook up to the patient, we monitor against that plan. When something triggers, the right person comes to the patient. I used to oversee an emergency room in a, in a university setting. And we developed a neat program where we integrated our emergency room with our clinic, trying to create a continuum. And we did some pretty cool stuff. But what I realized kind of after the fact is a lot of times the person showing up in the emergency room who was going to get admitted for heart failure is somebody I should have seen two days ago. But I had no clue that I needed to see him. I didn't have the technology to do it. But with telemedicine, that technology exists. And so it's gonna get better, it's gonna get cheaper, it's gonna get easier to use, but progressively it's a journey to move from a bimodal health system. And when I say bimodal health system, most of us are trained inside of a hospital and it's incredible the care you can get inside of a hospital. But when you leave that hospital, you go from integrated complete care to kind of reacted fragmented care. So if you think about telemedicine a little different, about virtual care, it's the ability for us to extend our care teams from the institution to the patient, to take our patient-centric approach that we've learned how to do and get the highest value inside of a hospital, mm -hmm. and why can't we make that patient-centricity work 24-7, 365, with us proactively bringing care to a patient instead of waiting for the patient to come to us. It's not easy, it's a, it's a challenging solution to put it all together, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and say for questions, the other side is, if we could, f for instance, make heart failure an ambulatory condition today, 
why isn't it being done? I have you think about that, and we'll come back to it. That, yes, I'm very interested to come back to that. Um, but first, I want to turn to Maureen. Um, the VA is the country's largest integrated healthcare system. Uh, and so, you know, the way that they use telehealth has implications across the country. Can you talk a little bit about the presence of telehealth at the VA? Sure, thank you. Thanks for inviting us to present. And um, I just wanted to give, first of all, a little, um, probably a false separation, but a description of the three kinds of telehealth services that, that VA provides. The first one has been spoken about, the clinical video telehealth, which is a lot like FaceTime or Skype in some ways, but may also have monitoring components to it. it that in VA typically occurs real time. And it started in VA in 2002. We've had over 248,000 vets in the last fiscal year engaged in clinical video visits. We have over 45 specialties represented so there is a lot of um, buy-in for using this as a particular technology that could be very patient-centered. We wouldn't want to force anyone to do clinical video telehealth if they're not interested, but certainly there are very many people interested. It cuts down very significantly on travel time and improves convenience for our veterans. The second one I wanted to talk about is the home telehealth program, and that's what some of you have spoken of before. Typically, this involves the care and case management with the monitoring for some chronic conditions. And it provides that non-institutional care support to patients using in-home mobile devices to manage diabetes or chronic diseases. And in particular, um, as, um, as was just mentioned by Randall, congestive heart failure, um, very sensitive conditions to the kind of monitoring that needs to happen. But this is another example of care that doesn't happen in a vacuum, and it's not only about the technology, because we have the care coordinators who interact with our patients that are in the home. We have about a 1 to 100 ratio, so each care coordinator oversees um, 100 patients. And, and the interventions can happen relatively quickly. Something like CHF is very sensitive to the weight of the patients, like increases in weight, make you very concerned about fluid increases and uh, retention. And so the interaction can happen without a visit to the, um, to the physician's office or anything. And um, real time changes can be made to manage that condition. For last year, we treated over 156,000 veterans with home telehealth monitoring. Um, this is something I think I mentioned that began in 2003. Over 40,000 of them were veterans that we helped to live independently. And um, I'm really happy to say that for those veterans that received home telehealth services, and this is getting at Ashley's question about cost, the, um, the average cost per patient saved per year is $2,000. So that translates into, for us, a 54% decrease in bed days of care and a 32% decrease in hospital admissions. So it really is a, a, a game changer and it really is an investment that we feel is worth making. Not only do we feel it, but the veterans who are able to stay in their homes and the caregivers that get that support feel that way as well. The last kind we generally conceptualize is store and forward telehealth where it's, it's asynchronous as you mentioned for us. The classic example is teleretinal imaging. With teleretinal imaging, a veteran might need to have um, the back of their eyes imaged regularly because of their diabetes. This kind of screening should happen on an ongoing basis. But imagine a veteran that comes to an, an, a community-based outpatient clinic, which might be miles from the optometrist or ophthalmologist. We have telehealth te technicians that are trained to image the back of the eye with a, a camera and that image is stored and forwarded to an optometrist who, or an ophthalmologist who can read that and make um, evaluations and judgments about who should then be seen in the clinic. That is a real uh, satisfier for our patients because it cuts down on extra visits and so forth. Telesleep, telespirometry, telewound care and all are, are part of this. And we had over 379,000 episodes of care like that last year. I mean, 379,000 unique veterans enrolled in that kind of telehealth last year. So uh, I mentioned a lot of numbers. We've had last year 2.1 million episodes of care with telehealth. 
and 45% of the patients that we treat live in rural areas, which for VA is really important because we have distinct medical centers, but we don't want to feel like we're limited for providing care there. We have community-based outpatient clinics, and that's great. But there are people that live significant distances from our community-based outpatient clinics that we certainly want to be able to be responsive to them and focus on convenience as well. So um, the other statistic I want to share is the home monitoring we use for mental health conditions as well. And um, that reduced, so when I give these statistics about patient and bed days of care and so forth, each patient is serving as his or her own control. In the year before we started the home telehealth monitoring to the year after. So when I mentioned reduced bed days, of days oops, reduced bed days of care, that was a 54% decrease for each patient. And when I mentioned hospital admissions, that would be a 32% decrease for that patient. And for telemental health conditions, acute psychiatric bed days of care, there was a 35% decrease. You may know that VA also pays travel costs for veterans who have service-connected conditions. So we also um, do have some savings in not requiring veterans to travel. Um, we've, we've learned a lot. We want to share a lot, but you know there are still plenty of lessons to learn. We are a large system. I, I sometimes have, and I have a dream speech, like my dream is that we will truly function as a system and that when we have a need one place or a surge in returning veterans in another place, that our system can rise up and use telemedicine to help um, our other kind of facilities and partners so that we don't have to worry about the boundaries of where people are actually placed. Um, I, I know that we have barriers and I'm happy to talk about the barriers. I feel like I spend a greater part of my time working down the barriers, but um, I just wanted to share with you that uh, as someone who practices telemedicine from my desk right here like this with this de device, I'm a psychiatrist by training, um, I, I'm very pleased to share with you my excitement and VA's excitement about telehealth. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so to take the pin back out and talk a little bit about, let's go, let's go back and then let's go forward. So um, this is you know, not a, a very new technology, but it seems to be having a greater pace of applications now. Um, why do you think now and, and what has been the holdup? <laughs> and then let's address maybe, uh, you know, what the pace is going to be going forward in the next five to 10 years. So whoever wants to, wants to jump in, just please do. So maybe I can just start by saying, I think uh, there have been some ch changes in technology, right? So broadband has become more ubiquitous. Video technology has gotten better. So there's a bunch of technological changes that have been very important. I also think that we're changing the way we're thinking about delivering healthcare. Um, we're thinking more around population health. We're thinking a lot more about cost. Um, we're thinking a lot more about quality. And you put all of that together with a new set of technologies and you get a renewed attention and interest in something that's been around for a long time, but now uh, with a lot of new applications. Um, I want to add one new, one other technology that's changed and that's mobile technology. Um, you know, now each of us has a supercomputer in our pocket, and not only us, but everyone in the world does for the most part. Uh, this year, 2015, is the year that there will be more uh, mobile phones in use than there are people on the planet. <laughs> what that means is that we can bring the technology to individuals, we can use it in a wide variety of ways, and the processing power that's available to us allows us to do all these magical things that we couldn't do before. The other piece is healthcare, as we all know, is facing significant headwinds. Uh, reimbursement's coming down. We can't sustain the rate of increases of the cost of care. Uh, and it's challenging the current model of care. So as you talked about before, it's, I think we're after a 20, 30 year journey, a lot, of, a lot of forces are aligning with one of the big ones being as a society, we need to make differences. And then as we've learned over the years of what works and doesn't work, one of the big lessons uh, and one of the reasons we have a, a large dedicated center going up is to build the critical mass of teams that can make this work and show what it can do. But over time, uh, and we're already actively in the effort, is how do we integrate this in the day-to-day -day care of what clinicians do throughout their day? Uh, to where it's going to be more and more. I see a patient in a clinic, I see a patient in a hospital, I go in my clinic and I see two patients in a room and I go and see two patients virtually. And the people I'm seeing, I'm seeing kind of just in time. 
Uh, there's a whole lot of pieces to be put together. Technology, people have focused on, and it's a mistake made in business a lot of times, technology is only an enabler. And for you know, every dollar you spend on technology, you'll spend another five or six dollars in putting the team and processes together behind it. But the lack of recognition of what is required for a whole solution has really held us up. We put technology in place and it goes into a system that works the way it's always been incentivized to work. So we need the, the bright thinking of people who are dedicated, <laughs> focused to this, who can show the power of what can be done. Maureen, did you want to add to that? This is Maureen. Sure, I, I couldn't agree with that statement more. We talk a lot about the concept of a digital dial tone so that a provider could go from seeing a patient in person to seeing a patient um, by video to phone calls to you know e-consults or whatever it is that we're doing, but to make it not clunky, excuse the expression for the provider so that they don't have to spend a lot of time going through this system or that system, but just to have ease because I think that's an important part of of improving access to care, pr making sure we maximize the provider's time and yet also having the flexibility for that provider to move from person to person. I, I did mention our people and I, I couldn't agree with you more that we do need to have provider buy-in, but we also have, need to have support, like people handy if something goes wrong with the technology or people handy if we, you know, if we need to kind of go the extra mile to engage a particular veteran for us or something like that. But I would wholeheartedly agree with what your statement was. And this kind of delves back into what you'd said initially, Ashish, about um, cost and, and some. So I, I'm wondering if we can go, go back to that and talk about what some of the um, cost saving uh, measures there are and, and some of the ones that are that are not yet in place and maybe also lessons from low income countries uh, that are informing our care here. So if somebody else wants to, to lead off, I mean, my, my overall sense is that the opportunity for saving money here is quite substantial. Um, this is a technology that should replace a lot of the things that we do now. Um, much of the data suggests that it's been an additive, not necessarily a replacement. That is not to say, therefore, it'll never save money. To me, it just means that not that the technology has to get better, though maybe the technology also has to get better, but we have to figure out those processes that you keep talking about, Randall, which I could not agree with more. To, to really identify what processes let you use the technology in ways that you can save money. And I would say we're still early in the journey of figuring that out. And, and to, to that point, I think the, uh, you know, historically, even within institutions, we've operated in silos. Uh, certainly across institutions, we're in silos. Uh, and it creates a lot of duplication, replication, and inefficiency that in many ways, financially, we've all been rewarded for. We're all paid for what we do. But as, as reimbursement shifts to outcome for the individual, for subpopulations, for populations, the rules change. So we, we feel, for instance, we shouldn't all be duplicating this. We should be working together across the country as providers mm -hmm. and bringing all the stakeholders in to figure out how to do this. But we also have to deal with the reality of, uh, I have been involved in many programs over the years that have showed tremendous improvements in outcomes. And most of those became pilot projects that never went anywhere. And the reason is that the elephant in the room is the value is being created, but where's the value going in whose pocket? And for a hospital, let's, let's use the heart failure again. If we eliminated, say, 2,000 hospitalizations for heart failure for a system, moderately sized system, and they're getting $10,000 for each one of those hospitalizations today. On paper, most people say, we're losing money on those people because our fully loaded cost for hospitalization is $11,000. So why not just stop it? Because when you look at the real contribution to keeping that system running, there may be five, six, or seven thousand dollars of cash from that hospitalization that pays the, for the people, the care teams, that have to be there. <coughs> so if you go back to the ACO, is that the answer? I don't think so. Because the, think about the ACO. If you do a good job, you're going to split a, pol a small piece of money 50 50. But if you were the hospital from which you put the effort in to build a virtual care center and put teams in place, all new added costs that, by the way, are not reimbursed or are lightly reimbursed, and you took the hospitalization away, you may have increased your costs 25%, and you're getting to save part of the hospitalization. So when it comes to splitting the benefit, the payer is going to keep 125%. You're going to be minus 25% from where you started.
And that doesn't mean the ACL concept is wrong, but what we've got to think about is how much net value is created. And we've got to create glide paths to say, if you've got these expenses, until you can take these expenses out, we've got to give you a pathway to do it. To actually split the, ben the net benefit and reinvest that so that we can improve the care, improve the models, and shift to this patient-centered care. I think one of the problems is that um, <laughs> we're trying to do many things because, in fact, creating new ways of delivering care using technology improves access, improves quality. I think there is, as Ashish mentioned, evidence for that. The problem is that when you measure the costs of those things, you measure in costs of more people being involved in the system and who are getting better care. And so it may be that the cost is going up or it may be going up for one piece and coming down, as you <coughs> mentioned, for another piece, but few people are looking at the whole system and saying, what is the net change in total cost to the system? Mm -hmm. Because certainly in this country, there is no system. And in most other <coughs> places, there are just a multitude of players, each of whom only has a particular lens on the problem. So I think that kind of system-wide looking at what's changing and how are we going to measure costs in a more rigorous way is really needed. Marina, Steve, do you want to? This morning, I, I, I'd like also to add that, um, you know, our system has built up as a kind of bricks and mortar system, and that's not my original term, certainly people smarter than me talk about this all the time. But, you know, when you think about a system that's built up on, on a basis of a hospital-based care, kind of like was mentioned before, this is a technology that crosses all of that that we're talking about. And so we are all caught in some real um, administrative barriers as a result. Our system as a whole doesn't want to um, adapt sometimes because of those those barriers, What, how we measure RVUs or how we capture workload or how we determine a standard visit. Uh, I'll give an example, teledermatology. When people forward a photo of a lesion, well, the standard of care in dermatology is to do a whole body scan. But when people are doing telederm, they're often not doing that whole body scan. They're doing the photo that was sent to them. So how do we um, restructure our concept of quality if what if what we're doing with one exam might not be the full criteria for another? Or But, but yet, how do we ensure that patients, meanwhile, are getting the care they need? I think the the connections, the information security, and all of that that are that we're used to in our kind of bricks and mortar world are also challenges. That, but the administrative challenges, I think, are bigger than just about any others that we've faced. Yes, one more thing, and then let's go to the question. Uh, an, an, another pushback that commonly comes is. Is, is a, this can't be as good as me seeing the patient in the clinic? And the answer is absolutely, it can't be. But I also push back right away and say 99% of the time we can't be where the patient needs us when they need us. So it's not that clinic and live care ever goes away, it's that can, again, can we see the heart failure patient two days earlier uh, via video and give a little extra diuretic and tell them to use their oxygen and rest and check them back and avoid the ICU intubation two days later. That little, was it as good as being there in the clinic or in the hospital? No. Uh, did, what was its effect? Potentially huge. We've got to recognize both though, know what people do today and give them new tools, then also give them the support to do that. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's uh, let's go to the audience, please. Hi, I'm Dr. Cohn from the uh, a nearby community hospital called the Brigham and Women's Hospital. It's around the corner. Uh, many of my colleagues, <clears throat> primary care physicians, get four or five hundred emails a day from their patients. And it's very helpful. They save a lot of visits and they save a lot of money by answering these things. But I'm going to raise a very provocative question to this panel. Uh, should these people these primary care doctors that do all this telemedicine, should they be compensated for this in some modest way? I think they should, because I think that not only are they having um, time, their time utilization, but there's also a medical malpractice implication here as well. And I just wondered if the panel could uh, 
address that. I, th I personally think they should be compensated in a new regulatory way, which I think would decrease hundreds of thousands of unnecessary clinic visits, and they would still get some, as you said, 99% good medicine. Um, but I think they should be compensated in some way. Could I have the panel uh, answer that question? So I, I would... So, Dr. Cohn, I, I would agree with that wholly, and, and the way I would describe it is I think we have to reconceptualize what is the job of a primary care physician. And it is not just about seeing people in clinic. It's also about <coughs> answering emails. It's also about doing phone visits. And if we think of all of that as part of his or her job, then they should be getting paid for the entire set of activities. Now, whether you do it as a salary or you do it as a fee for each of the different elements, I, I'm more agnostic. There are people who feel like everybody should be salaried. That, that's fine. But the bottom line is that what has happened is we still conceptualize the job as the doctor visit in the clinic, and then all the stuff is add-on. It can't be that way. It's not add-on. It's actually core to the functioning of a good primary care physician. Yeah, looking at it another way, I, a, as a primary care physician at one point, it was, I think my job should be to try to optimize the health of the people I serve. How I was paid was for my individual units of intervention. I would rather not see telemedicine, virtual care be a yet another fee-for-service item because then we're focused on the item instead of the outcome. So, you know, ways to do that from the health plan side would be take the primary care physicians and they get $40 per person per month in their panel for an average person. That can be risk adjusted. I get a really sick patient, that person might be $1,000 a month because I've got to spend a lot more time with them. Then figure out how to get them what they need just in time. The other piece you mentioned, we have to be very, very careful about virtual care and it can be just slammed quickly. Uh, great study showing the more you're disrupted in your daily workflow, the less you can concentrate, the more mistakes are going to be made, right? <laughs> well, chuckle's going on right away. Everybody's been there. Uh, that's actually part of the reason we built a virtual care center. And until we can work out the workflows, we want to put filters in place. Like through our monitoring of all of our beds, we've reduced our alerts into our nurses by 93%. And the ones that are going now, they know they need to act on, uh, as opposed to being bombarded with thousands of interruptions a day. So I'd like to think more holistically and back to the, if, if our responsibilities in keeping people uh, in optimal health for where they are, maybe again that's what we pay for. Lisa, do you want to take some questions from online? Yes, thanks. We do have a lot of questions online, so I'm going to offer a few of them. And unfortunately, Steve Crossan did have to get off, and I wanted to include one of these questions before he did, but perhaps you can help us with this, Mark. In the era, in the era of rapid telehealth market growth, the monitoring regulation of health information on the web is becoming complex, especially in developing countries where patients are dependent on the web information rather than upon physicians. How can developing countries best benefit from telehealth when there is a big emerging market of telehealth in these countries? Um, I think the first real challenge is that most, um, most emerging countries, in fact, most countries really don't understand telehealth. They are way behind and don't appreciate that it's something other than sending a text message to remind a patient to come to an appointment, for example. Uh, maybe that's telemedicine, but it's pretty low-lying fruit. Um, so I think that the first real thing is that countries rethink what they mean by a health system delivering care and how can they use technology to support that? Um, do we want to filter how individuals access information on the web? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I, it's not my area of expertise. I don't think we're likely to be able to do that in any case. Um, but I do think that there's a need to accept that people have access to all kinds of information that, um, that technology is going to change the way both information and care is being delivered. And how can we use that effectively begins by recognizing that it's not something to be avoided but to be embraced. Thank you. We, we are getting a lot of questions about privacy issues related to this, so I did just want to ask one of those. Does the use of telehealth technology raise new privacy and security questions? Could someone electronically eavesdrop on doctor-patient communication or intercept or even tamper with the results of tests that are delivered online? 
What are telehealth, telehealth experts doing to protect patient privacy and security? It's all you. It's all, it's all <laughs> you. It, it made our friend from the VA, right? Yeah. Maria, but technology ex exists today. So for instance, you know, FaceTime, Skype, the original stuff out there was not made to be medically secure yet. It wasn't HIPAA ready compliant, uh, but there are uh, ways to make the technology work. So for instance, if somebody penetrates the video stream, it just disconnects. Uh, so security can be, put, can be put in place, and I think the VA has been on the cutting edge with its different layers of security. So I'll turn to Maureen. Sure, I'd be happy to address this. I don't feel like we have the best answer yet, but I do feel like we have the security. <laughs> Let me just say that um, when in the mid-2000 decade is when we started with the clinical video telehealth, and in that era, the securest platform was this and I'll use the word clunky again, rather clunky platform of using multiple sign-ins similar to what we use for our own clinical video, con for our non-clinical video conferences. And, and that's cumbersome, but it met the need at that point. But that was 10 years ago. And we really, really want to move toward a system where we can use the smartphones or other devices the patients have. But I have to tell you that we are very, very cautious because we want to ensure that the care that the veterans that entrust their care to us have their privacy protected. The last thing we would want is anything to be broadcast over the internet or anything like that. We have veterans who have, a, you know, served our nation and done amazing things, but also deal with terrible struggles, particularly related to PTSD. And some of them are reluctant to even participate in clinical video telehealth. So we want to make sure we honor that. So we probably go very, very far into the security um, in an effort to prevent the release of any kind of information. But we are looking at new ways and certainly the new technology that's available, the clouds, whether it can be within our firewall and so forth in order to allow for security and decrease the clunkiness. Yep. I, I can tell you our home, our home telehealth, for instance, it does, the input data, for instance, when the patient might put their weight or vital signs or how their mood is that particular day into the home telehealth system, it doesn't even go directly to our patient medical record. It goes to a site that the, the care coordinators I mentioned are able to access, download, and enter into the record. Obviously, we want patient-generated data to communicate directly with our medical record, but you know we also want to have the record have meaningful data. So that's, that's a, a, a tightrope we're walking right now in terms of understanding the best way to get patient-generated data into our permanent records. I, I, just, I, I think it's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. I throw out to, to ask the audience to, and to, to be thinking about also the practical side. Security, if anything, has swung fairly conservatively in trying to protect everything for, for laws, lawsuits, and just respecting the individual. But I can also tell you, and I've talked to many, many providers, whether it's in the VA or across other systems, we have a lot of people today who can't access care and are literally dying or, and having significant exacerbations that are diseased for the sake of privacy. Uh, so as a society, I mean, we have to take a step backwards at times and ask the question of what should be the balance. Thank you. I'll just do one more, but we have a really active chat, uh, so I encourage everyone to go on. We have had a number of questions about billing, Medicaid, Medicare, so I'll just take this one. How should the American healthcare system deal, deal with billing and coding of telehealth and telemedicine procedures, especially in the emergency department and in rural settings where people receiving the procedures may not be able to afford them? And some questions about, you know, does Medicaid cover this, Medicare? Be great if someone could address that. Well, I, be, I believe from a billing perspective, first of all, my bias again would be to be paying on the basis of population and outcomes and forms of capitation, subcapitation, tied outcomes. But until we do that, until we align the incentives also, there are many states, Medicaid, that are currently paying for telehealth. Some are on par with live visits, some are not. A whole variety of ways to do it. We're always afraid as a society, if we put a code out there, it's going to be misused and maybe we just start giving too much care again. Uh, but have paying for appropriate care when we can keep people from needing to take the time to schedule a, a, an appointment to further deteriorate 
to come in later to drive 200 miles, it, it, it does make so much more sense for us to pay for a visit so long as that visit's delivering what needs to be done. And it can be another pathway for us to get to population health. And the only thing I'll add is I think you are seeing increasingly <coughs> uh, both public and private payers recognizing the value of this kind of technology. Uh, everybody's doing it a little differently. I actually think that's fine. It's, we're experimenting with kind of what the right payment model is, what the right amount of payment ought to be. Um, and we need to carefully study this stuff and understand what's the optimal way to pay for these services uh, so we use just the right amount to get the right care. Thank you. Great. Um, so we like to end these sessions by uh, each contributing, not, not me, but you, <laughs> each contributing <laughs> a, uh, a policy takeaway. What is one thing that you can think of, what one impediment that could be removed through a policy change that would, um, that would help to improve access to, to telemedicine? So uh, mine would be to kind of go back to the concern that I raised initially where we are starting to see some amount of pushback. We have states that are worried about this technology. Um, look, this is still in the early days. I think the potential benefit of this technology is massive in terms of both improving access, quality, and ultimately lowering costs. Um, we have to give it some running room. We have to l try out different models. And not all of it will work. Um, but and particularly for states, we've seen states that are very restrictive, have much lower levels of adoption of these technologies. The people who lose in that context are the patients who can't access high quality care. And so my general takeaway is we've got to give this technology a chance. Um, mine would be similar, that the changes that are underway um, based on technology are not going away. Um, you know, everybody will have mobile phones and we'll use them, maybe we'll lose landlines. And healthcare will be delivered in different ways in different places. In very poor countries, it will use mobiles, it will do, um, use more non-physician providers in this country. We'll still have probably many doctors, uh, but maybe other kinds of providers and certainly telemedicine and home monitoring. I think the trick is to, as I said earlier, to embrace the technology and the changes rather than to try to avoid it. We might come back to <clears throat> our need to align incentives and to understand that we're not talking about technology, we're talking about whole new solutions. And to create a glide path for organizations that are primarily hospital-based organizations, large clinics, and find a way to open up those walls maintain the current reimbursement while you shift to bringing care to patients. And again, that means don't immediately look at a, how much do I save by doing it this way versus this way. Look at it as a system, a system that's got to move from individual units of care provided to, into, to people to optimizing the health of people within a population. And I would just add that if possible, I'd like for us to kind of commit to making this easy make it easy for the patients to connect, make it easy for the providers to engage in, because that, that's really, that's what's really gonna get more buy-in and it's really gonna be able to improve the access and the quality and the satisfaction that as you mentioned in the beginning. Wonderful, well thank you so much to all the panelists for your insights and thoughts um, and thank you for joining us. I'd like to encourage everyone to continue the conversation on the forum website, as Lisa mentioned. Um, and I'd also like to mention that the next panel, Opioid Painkiller Abuse and the Crisis, will take place this Monday, May 18th at 12.30 p.m. Um, please watch at forumhsph.org. And thank you. Thank you, Mayor.